care medicine uh first grand rounds of the year it's my pleasure to welcome dr davis thank you so much for joining us today um i just wanted to um remind everyone that new this year we will be offering cme credit for all the people who are attending uh the critical care grand round series there was an email that was sent out yesterday with how to register for cme cloud mm. and this number the 24840 if you text it to the phone number in the instructions, you will get your uh, CME credit. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gunwani, who will be directing uh, and uh, helping the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ken Davis really needs no introduction, but I'm going to go over the basics, mostly for the young ones who um, have not been here long as long as I have and have seen some of these uh, uh, changes occur, these remarkable changes. Dr. Davis has been the president and the CEO of the Mount Sinai Medical Center and later the Mount Sinai Health System since 2003, after he spent 15 years as the chair of Mount Sinai's Department of Psychiatry. He successfully led Mount Sinai through an era of remarkable growth and change and turmoil, including the creation of a multi-hospital health system, the transformation of care delivery, and the unprecedented pandemic of the past three years or so. He is more than being this remarkable leader. A lot of people may not know that he really has been a leading researcher in psychiatry and psychopharmacology. He developed the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, which is now the most widely used tool designed specifically to evaluate the severity of cognitive and non-cognitive behavioral dysfunctions characteristics to patients with Alzheimer's disease. This tool is used by the FDA to evaluate drugs and their efficacy for Alzheimer's. And his research led to four of the first five FDA approved drugs for Alzheimer's. He's also done seminal work on schizophrenia and essentially showed that anatomic areas uh, changes, anatomic changes uh, in oligodendroglial cells and myelin play roles in the diseases pathophysiology, and that dopamine, which was long thought to be hyperactive in a schizophrenic brain, is actually hypoactive in different regions. His paper, Dopamine in Schizophrenia, Review and Reconceptualization in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 91, is the third most cited paper on schizophrenia research in its decade. Dr. Davis attended the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and completed a residency and fellowship in psychiatry and psychopharmacology respectively at the Stanford University Medical Center. Upon returning to Mount Sinai, he served as chief of psychiatry at the Bronx VA Medical Center and launched Sinai's research program in the biology of schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease therapeutics. In 2002, he was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences in, remark in recognition of his remarkable contribution to the field of brain diseases. In 2006, he served as the president of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and has received its Joel Elkies Award, Daniel Efren Research Award, Paul Hawk, this Distinguished Service Award and has won awards from many other organizations, most notably the Alzheimer's Association, the Society for Biological Psychiatry, and the American Psychiatric Institute Association. He was also awarded the George H. W. Bush Lifetime of Leadership Award from Yale University. In 2014, he was named a trustee of the Aspen Institute, which is a group of diverse nonpartisan thought leaders who are creative scholars and members of the public to address some of the world's most complex problems. And as late as last year, he was recognized by modern healthcare as one of the 100 most influential people in healthcare. There's a lot more to be said, but I'm going to let Dr. Davis do uh, some of that saying. So without much further ado, let's um, launch into some of these questions. You ready, Dr. Davis? Yes, I am. Ready to go. Okay. Now, aside from what I talked about, could you describe your journey from essentially being 
a clinician scientist, who is leader of a large hospital and then later a large integrated delivery system. Well, <clears throat> thank you. And um, that is a complicated question for me to answer. So it'll take a little bit of time. From the earliest point that I can remember conceptualizing what I wanted to do with my life, I wanted to be a scientist. And when you grow up and go to uh, elementary school in the 1950s, the most important scientist in the world was Albert Einstein. And even I didn't have the hubris to think that I could be a scientist because no one could be like Albert Einstein. So I kept to myself the notion that I wanted to be a scientist. I don't know where that came from. There was nobody in my family who wanted to do that, but this is what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, when I could, I, I got a chemistry set and uh, started to make rockets and almost blew myself up a couple of times. Um, but I enjoyed being doing science. So um, when I entered medicine, it was always with the notion that I would be some kind of scientific researcher and uh, was fascinated with psychiatric disease. Again, I don't know why. Um, no one in my family had a major psychiatric disease. I was just fascinated with the brain and how the brain worked. And I can remember being driven to see my grandfather and grandmother who lived when I was a young kid in Florida and we lived in New York and we would take a three day trip all the way down from New York to Florida. And I was sitting there, I was probably about 13, reading the biography of Sigmund Freud. I don't know where that came from, but I was fascinated with these questions. And um, by the time I reached college and I was a psychology major and I did research even in college, um, I had this feeling that this whole Freudian stuff was all wrong, that it just couldn't possibly be that people would be delusional and have hallucinations, hear voices because of some oral, anal, or phallic problem that they had had when they were three, four, or five. It just didn't make sense. It made sense to me that there were some crazy things going on in the brain and that there was something wrong. And um, I entered medical school. Uh, came to Mount Sinai because it was a new school and it had only 40 students. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a different kind of medical school. Um, you know, I, there'll be small group learning. I'll have a chance to do lots of things. And about six months into medical school, like probably a lot of other people in this meeting today, I had a feeling that I'd made the worst decision in my life, that medical school was awful. How was I gonna find a way to make this reasonable? And the good fortune was Mount Sinai had um, a lot of elective time, all afternoon was free. And I chose with good fortune to become, uh, and take an elective that took me then every afternoon and every summer in a laboratory in the pharmacology department that was dealing with neurotransmitters and the neurotransmitter basis of what they thought of psychiatric disease. And we started to study catecholamines and then indolamines in uh, depression and bipolar disease. And it was what I loved. Um, I was back in the laboratory, I was being a scientist and it made medical school tolerable. Um, so my commitment was always to be a scientist uh, when I, went to Stanford, it was in a research track, psychiatric research track. Fellowship was um, with the VA to be uh, a career development award, again, to do science. My, um, I had this good, good fortune of my mentor was kind of the godfather of psychopharmacology. His name was Leo Hollister. And Leo said to me when I joined him, he said, Ken, here's the deal. You do my studies and then you can do whatever you want in your studies. So I had studies. I, there are things I wanted to do. Having worked in the laboratory at Mount Sinai for four years, there were neurotransmitters I wanted to study. And I was put on the Clinical Research Center, which was at the Palo Alto VA. And I spent six years there um, doing science, writing papers, even got a huge grant. Pro first program project grant for the National Institute on Aging was my program project to look at experimental therapeutics of Alzheimer's disease. And that was to study the cholinergic nervous system. 
So when I was recruited away from Stanford to run the psychiatry unit at the Bronx VA, it was to turn it into a research service because the Bronx VA was at that time a very special VA hospital. It had uh, Roz Yallo who had won the Nobel Prize. And we were very proud of the Bronx VA. It was a research hub in the Veterans Administration. And they wanted me to start a research psychiatry service, which was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and I brought in a vice chair who was an associate with me from Stanford um, to be kind of the clinical director. And I ran the research programs, ran the start up a research unit, got started to get a lot of grants, recruit a lot of people, a lot of them still doing science today and were very successful. We were a young group of people just enjoying the science, doing what we wanted to do. I did that for a bunch of years and then chairmanship of psychiatry became available at Mount Sinai. Uh, I was asked to do it. I said it would be the same conditions in which I do the Bronx VA, which is I'm the researcher, have a vice chair, runs the clinical department. That became Debbie Marin. Um, and uh, we continue to do research. So I'm doing that for about 15 years. And 2002 comes along and Mount Sinai is in a lot of trouble. Um, I'm on a committee with a number of trustees, a number of the chairs, which is called the turnaround committee. And we are swarming, Mount Sinai is swarming with consultants mm -hmm. whose job it is to save Mount Sinai and to cut expenses so that we would have a PL statement that wasn't as, bis as dismal as it looked. So uh, during that period in 2002, the CEO resigns, steps away, and he goes to Penn. And the dean steps down, and they make Nate Case, the dean, uh, as stepping in temporarily. Um, so they need a dean and a CEO. And they come to me and I think, well, you know, I guess I don't want to end my scientific career. So if I become the dean, let somebody else be the CEO, I will be able to keep doing science. And I just had this very big discovery. We had done the first genetic sequencing of autopsy human schizophrenic brains. Never been done before. So we have this genetic profile of a whole bunch of schizophrenics, obviously, you know, this is a brain bank that I had been collecting for years, people who died with schizophrenia. And I'm looking at all the results and I'm looking at the data and I think I'm supposedly gonna find that there's a neurotransmitter or neurotransmitters that are abnormal. And to my surprise, there's a whole group of genes that are all underexpressed. And what do they come from? Oligodendrocytes. And I think, oh my God, I've been studying the biology, the neurotransmission, the, 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 the neurotransmitters for decades and it's all about myelin and oligodendrocytes. We had it all wrong. We write a paper. It goes to the proceed in the PNAS, Proceeds the National Academy of Science. You know, it's the most prestigious journal in science, and it's all about myelin and oligodendrocytes. Um, and I think the good news is, if I'm the dean, I'll be able to keep doing this. So they choose me to be the dean. I'm the dean in January 2003. And by the end of February, I got called into the chairman of the board of trustees office, Peter May, he was the new chairman. And he says, you know that CEO Ken Burns that we hired about eight months ago? Well, we're firing him. He can't figure this out. And we want you to be the dean and the CEO. I think to myself, oh my God, this isn't what I ever wanted to do. I just had another big scientific discovery. I love science. Um, I, how am I gonna fix this? And I think about it and I knew because I was on the turnaround committee how bad things were. Most people don't know this. Uh, when Peter May told me to do this job, we had two weeks of payroll left, two weeks of cash for payroll. That's how bad things were. So I'm walking around Mount Sinai thinking, what am I gonna do? And what I recall is when I was seven years old, I was taken to Mount Sinai um, for what turned out to be uh, a major surgery that was an emergency surgery. It was actually Mother's Day 
and I was seven years old. And I remember that I was taken from Madison Avenue from my parents' car in a stretcher right to the OR. Um, so we'd always been connected to Mount Sinai. My aunt, who I was very close to, had been a nurse at Mount Sinai. I'd been had this big surgery at Mount Sinai. I was in the second medical school class at Mount Sinai. And now I'm being asked to give up my scientific career and be the CEO and the dean. I think, I guess I have to do this because it's gonna take them another six months to a year to find somebody in a national search. And by then we're done, you know, and that's gonna be on me. So I said to Peter May, I'll do it. And he says, we'll do it together. And that's what we did. Uh, so I'm the accidental CEO. If somebody says, how did you train for this? The answer is I didn't. Um, why did this job happen? And I think what can be learned from it is if you choose a career that is your passion and you really do it with all your heart and put everything into it, like I did about brain science, that's what I was just wanting to do. And that's what I did as well as I possibly could. Maybe you'll be recognized for being effective in that field and you ultimately get other opportunities. Um, so there I was as the CEO um, with this nearly bankrupt organization in 2003. Um, and we, you know, we made it work. Uh, and I guess if, you know, I don't wanna talk all about this all the time, but if you want, we can talk more about how we turned it around in 2003 and what we learned from that. But Amish, that's up to you. You're, you're muted. Here on mute. That's such a remarkable story. And I remember some of that. There was the Hunter Group and the Stock Camp Associates and Janus uh, Revenue Cycle Manager, all kinds of consultants were walking the hallways of Mount Sinai. And it's a remarkable turnaround story. But for now, I just want to focus a little bit on your research career because yeah. what you did was actually very remarkable, right? It enabled standardization of severity of Alzheimer's disease and therefore a way forward to right. uh, determine the efficacy of medications. Well, actually that was only a small part of what we did. And I'll tell you how we did that. Okay. That was very simple. We knew what the core symptoms of Alzheimer's were. And my associate who was a good friend, Richard Mose, we worked together at the VA, and then he went on to become the head of neuroscience at Lilly. Um, we just sat in a cab one day. We were riding somewhere, and we figured out the questions, the domains. It took us like very little time to make up the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, and we validated it. The, no, the, the really important part of the research was finding that cholinesterase inhibitors could improve cognition in Alzheimer's disease. So that all the drugs that are approved now, which was first one was Aricept and Exelon and then Galanthamine, Reminil, they're all derived from my work. Um, and uh, either I or people in my lab worked alongside those companies from the molecule to their approval. We did that beginning in about 1975, 76. I mean, I, I had this amazing experience where there had been a paper published in the Archives of General Psychiatry that said when they gave physostigmine, a cholinesterase inhibitor, to manic patients, they were able to turn off the mania and make them depressed. And they could do that with just within 30 minutes of getting the drug into people. And I thought, if this isn't an example of how biology is the basis of psychiatric disease. I don't know what is. So I said to my, my mentor then, Leo Hollister, I wanted to replicate that study. I want to see if that was real. And um, Leo said, sure. And I, I did about 15 manix. And one of them says to me, like about halfway through the infusion, he says, you know, doc, my brain never felt clearer and sharper 
than it does right now. And I thought, gee, that's amazing that he thought that. So I went to the animal literature and there was a guy working with animals who said that when he gave cholinesterase inhibitors to these animals, they got smarter. They learned to maze faster. I thought that's incredible. So the next thing I did was a study in young Stan in Stanford College students who volunteered to get physostigmine and we did tests of their learning. And we found lo and behold, that we enhanced their ability to learn um, on something called the Bushke Selective Reminding Task. So that got published in Science. And, the, and as we were writing that paper up, studies were just being concluded in Alzheimer's patients, looking at their neurotransmitters, and they reported that there was a cholinergic deficit. So I concluded that paper in Science by saying, and this has implications for the use of these drugs in Alzheimer's disease. And by then we were using physostigmine for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, interestingly enough, my wife, who was a, a endocrinologist, also a researcher, even though we, we knew each other since seventh grade. But my wife says to me, uh, you know, uh, I've been to the library and I got a better drug than any of the ones you're using. This physostigmine thing, it's like short acting. It's, or, you know, you don't have to get it orally. I got a drug called uh, galanthamine that I think will be a lot better. It's an Eastern European drug. I said, Bonnie, where do they make the drug? She says, Bulgaria. I said, you think we're gonna get it out of Bulgaria? You think the FDA is gonna approve a drug that's from the Iron Curtain? Because that's what it was in the 70s. She said, well, let me see what I can do. And ultimately my wife and I were able to uh, license that drug to uh, Janssen. To, and so that became her drug and her company, which is still has a company that she's working on other drugs. So, you know, we, we um, the real important thing that we did was then develop all these drugs that became the first generation of Alzheimer's drugs. But if somebody had told me when we were doing that with all the companies that today, you know, decades after those drugs were approved, that we still wouldn't have another drug, except a silly biogen drug that doesn't really do anything, um, that we, those were still the mainstay of treatment, I would have been astounded. But that's the reality. Alzheimer's is a very hard biology to crack. Um, we're still confused as the role of, of amyloid and tau and what we should go after. Um, but uh, that was the work that, you know, I think I'm most proud of that we, you know, developed all those drugs, much more important than the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale, even though everybody uses that, um, the drugs are, are what I think we should be most acknowledged for. Amazing. Now. Are you still active in research? Do you still have a lab? No, I miss it a lot. Um, I can remember, uh, I, I rarely remember my dreams. That's a bad thing for psychiatrists, right? I rarely remember my dreams, but I remember this one very, very vividly. Um, I was back on running the research unit at the Bronx VA, and we were talking about science and more clinical trials and more biology, and it was one of the happiest dreams I ever had. And it was about five years ago when we were, as usual, um, uh, in pain over what the Mount Sinai hospital system p &L looked like and what we were going to do to uh, keep this system going. So it's a lot more fun to have been doing the science, but I don't do it anymore. I don't have any time for it. I don't have any time to stay up with the literature. And uh, being as far behind as I am, I only see it through my wife's eyes who still does science and uh, some of my colleagues yeah, great. still go to occasionally go to the meetings. Um, so but, no. you did give a little bit of leeway to Freud here with that dream, right? Yeah, a little bit, but you know, um, it wasn't from an oral anal phallic stage. <laughs> it was, it was because it was a dream of what I really wish I was doing. <laughs> okay. Now back to your leadership. Now, I remember around, I think around 2004, five, there was this big uh, tome. Uh, I think McKinsey produced a roadmap for the future or something. I remember we saw those slides about uh, uh, NIH funding versus research space and all that. Can you take us through that early journey uh, of the turnaround? Okay. How that came uh, about. You know what I'm talking about. Right? I am. So as you pointed out, at that period, we were swarming with consultants. 
And the um, first day I took over, the uh, head of the hunter group comes in and he has a whole bunch of FTE cuts that he's going to do again. And I look at this, and one of the cuts was to Margaret Prestusco's office, who's now you know the president, who's my associate. And I say, wait a minute, we can't cut that office. He said, why not? I said, because I need data. The only way we're going to turn this place around is I need to know where we make money and where we lose money. I need to know what service lines we make money. I need it down to a granular level. I need to know what DRGs we admit we make money and what DRGs we lose the most money on. And that's what her office does. I said, I'm a scientist. As a scientist, I need data. To figure out what's going wrong here, I got to find out where the profits are and where the losses are. And I need it as the most granular level. We're not firing her. So I sat down and I started to study all this stuff. And I realized that the problems that we were having wasn't so much in our expense side. The problems were, we were historically, and this was almost our demise, known as a great internal medicine hospital. This was the place where the great internists were. Um, but in the major surgeries, you know, we were okay, but it wasn't really our strength, our super strength. But you know where all the money was in? It was in orthopedics. It was in cardiovascular surgery. It was in neurosurgery, even GI surgeries. So I'm looking at where we're making money and where we're losing money. And I see that, you know, all the areas that we're making money, that we're making money and we don't have enough people and the people that we do have a lot in, if you're lucky, we're breaking even. And in some, we're just losing a fortune. I said, we got to recruit. My answer is going to be, we're going to spend our way out of this. We're going to recruit. We're going to go out there and we're going to recruit the best people in all the specialties that have the highest margins. So I went to the board of trustees meeting and I said, this is my plan. And you can imagine, you know, they're skeptical, but we have a lot of questions and answers. At the end, they call for a vote and the vote is unanimous that they're going to go ahead with my plan, which is a plan that's focusing on enhancing revenue, and we take the last money we have that is free from the endowment. It was $90 million. That's what we had. That was all that was left. That was free money, and I get that money to recruit people, and we go out and start to recruit people. Um, so that's how we turned the place around, um, and I needed a whole group of different surgical chairs who could do that. I mean, I can tell you a, a story of a chair of orthopedics. Um, this is, you know, after I've initiated, we're going to recruit, we're going to recruit, we're going to recruit. So we're recruiting a big orthopedic group. And uh, people on my management team are doing it. And finally, you know, we've got this group all lined up. And now the chairman of orthopedics is going to go out to dinner with them and meet them. And he comes into my office the next day. And I said, so how did it go? And he says, well, Ken, I had to tell him the truth. And I said, oh, well, what was the truth? He said, I had to tell him the ORs just don't work. I said, are you kidding? He said, we've just hired a new OR manager. It's going to work. You know it's going to work. He says, well, they're not going to come now. So I said, so tell me something. How long do you think you'd like to stay at Mount Sinai? So he says, I think I would be here about another six years, and then retire. I said, well, here's the news. You have six months, you're fired. And I made Evan Flato the chair of orthopedics. Um, and we went on like that through every surgical chair who was told your job is to recruit, recruit, recruit. That's how we're going to save Mount Sinai. So we did. Um, but when I went to that board meeting and I told them my plan, I was riding back to Mount Sinai and uptown with Dick Ravitch, who's on our board. And you know, Dick Ravitch had been a very prominent person in politics. He's, 
He knows a lot about public policy. And he turns to me as we're driving back and he says, you know something? This plan of yours better be right because if it isn't, you're gonna be the last CEO at Mount Sinai. That was a word of encouragement. So, um, but that's where we were and that's how we did it. I guess I that helped to focus the mind. Now, moving a little bit away from, so thank you so much. This is such a fascinating story and I'm sure it'll be several hours worth of uh, anecdotes. Just the last bit on this area, Describe the transition when you gave up your deanship uh, and focused solely as the president and CEO, and of course, later as only the CEO. Okay, well, um, I had been friendly for a very, very long time with Dennis Charney. His career and my career paralleled each other. He was at Yale, you know, I was at Mount Sinai, but we'd meet at all these meetings he would talk about depression, PTSD. I would talk about schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, but we were always very friendly. And um, Dennis, and, and then I became uh, a, um, one of, on the advisory committee of the NIMH. So I'm reviewing their intramural program. And uh, it's you know, got strengths and weaknesses, but one of the weaknesses was an affective disease and I decide, I, I suggest to them that they hire Dennis to take him away from Yale and be the head of what was the largest laboratories of the NIMH. So Dennis goes there and he's doing fine, but um, the NIMH, uh, you know, underpays everybody. And um, he's got a lot of kids and they're gonna all go to college. It's gonna cost him a lot of money and he's coming back here. We talk to each other a lot. So I say, uh, Dennis, why don't you join me here? and you'll be the dean for research. I'll stay on as dean, and you'll be the dean for research. And if that works out, in two years, you will be the dean, and then you'll run the school, and I can just run the healthcare system. And he says, sure, well, that's the plan. So I recruit Dennis here, and it works very well. Now, you should know that historically, since Mount Sinai started a school, often the person who ran the hospital and the person who ran the medical school didn't get along. They all thought that they were fighting for the same resources. And that kind of tension was destructive to the institution. So I knew that with me and Dennis, it'd be easy. We trusted each other for a very, very long time. We knew each other. So I brought Dennis on, made him ultimately the dean, and um, that was able to give me more time to focus on the healthcare system and gave them you know, a full-time dean who was far more accomplished than a dean we had previously had. Another member of the National Academy, um, good recruiter, uh, somebody who could make a real difference, and he has. But I think part of the good fortune there was, uh, I don't believe that much in search firms. I like to hire people that I know or somebody else on my team is knows very well. And we bring in the best people that way rather than to deal with the kind of search firms that want to just sell people. And, uh, you know, so Dennis, you know, was just a perfect person to be the dean and work alongside me. Perfect. And you're relinquishing the role of president. Well, um, that's because, well, it's, 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 it's a complicated story. Um, you don't my, it no, it's okay. My original contract would have ended a few years ago, and the board wanted me to stay on. But you know, there is a reality to the biology of aging. And you know, I will be 75 in a week. Um, and I never expect that I continue to be a CEO at this age. Yeah. So Margaret had always been the COO, the chief operating officer, and increasingly. She was doing more and more and more work. And I thought it was unfair for me to continue to keep these titles when in fact, she really was doing the day-to-day -day management of the system and I was working at a different level, strategically and in fundraising, um, you know, making, doing a lot of the planning. So I wanted her to have the recognition that she deserved. And that wouldn't happen without giving her the president title. 
Right. So that's when I just became CEO. Okay. And so, look, now this will be the last question as it pertains to your leadership and, of course, the emerging leadership. What challenges and opportunities for the health system do you foresee in the next five to 10 years? And what would be the qualities that would be required from the next generation of leaders to deal with these uh, issues? Uh, well, the problem that we have is that Medicaid pays us about 50 cents on the dollar of what it really costs us to take care of a Medicaid patient. Medicare pays us about 85 cents on the dollar for what it costs us. And we're over 60% across our system, Medicare and Medicaid. So we have what increasingly is a very difficult equation to put together and make work. Um, so that commercial insurance has to cross subsidize all the losses that we're getting in Medicare and Medicaid. That means we have to make Mount Sinai a very attractive place to people with commercial insurance. Um, in healthcare, geography is destiny. So where your hospitals lie tells you the communities you're gonna serve. Where your big ambulatory clinics lie is who's gonna come and see you. So we have to think very smartly about where we grow, how do we deal with this problem that we have by being so dependent on government payers um, to maintain the quality and to be able to do the kind of things that we continue to want to do to lead. Um, you know, we don't want to become, you're probably reading what happens to Maimonides. Um, we are a national leader. We want to maintain our presence as a national leader. Um, we need a very robust research program, medical school. We have to be on the cutting edge of everything clinically. That requires, you know, a P&L that's generating money. Um, and that's not going to happen if we're all Medicaid and Medicare. So the big challenge that we face is how to address that. Now that gets addressed at a number of levels. Today, I was on the phone with uh, a city council person. Um, yesterday, I met for a long time with a woman who's running for Senate from Florida, Val Demings. Uh, I just got a call from Maggie Hassan from New Hampshire who's running for Senate. Um, she's, she is the in, incumbent. So the, I have to spend a lot of time telling people who can make a difference what are the politics of the economics of healthcare in order that they understand what it takes if they're really going to have equity in who we take care of. If we institutionalize inequity in healthcare with underfunding Medicaid and underfunding Medicare, we can't turn around and say, why isn't everybody treated equally? Why doesn't everybody have the same outcome? Well, you've institutionalized inequity if you're gonna pay Medicaid 50 cents on the dollar for what it really costs. So if you, the most progressive people in this caucus, think that you're not going to spend money in your budget on Medicaid, don't talk to me about equity. You, know, you are institutionalizing inequity. So part of my work then is to make the political statement, the policy statements to get people to realize that, that doesn't work all that well for the most part. The other part is to find a management team that you can trust that can make changes. Um, and then the last part is philanthropy. Um, uh, we, I have to raise a lot of money, um, whether it's from the Hess family, the Kravis family, who I've just, you know, we're going to have major gift announcements from them. Uh, and you see their names all over the place. Uh, these are very important to us. We generate over $200 million a year in philanthropy. Um, we need that. Uh, you know, Carl Icahn has become a good friend of mine. Um, this year, at the end of this year, it comes a very, very big payment due for his having named the school. And it's going to happen over the next couple of years. So, you know, these are all the things that um, 
I spend my time on now that you know I have time to do because I have a good people in the management team who can take over some of the other responsibilities. Wow. Okay, now, um, well, thank you for that. I think this gives us a, a very great overview and a lot of the younger folks uh, who have not really been here for some of that journey are getting an idea of it. And you alluded to Maimonides. I, a lot of people don't know this, but Maimonides used to be really the pinnacle of heart surgery. They performed, I think, the first heart transplant in New York and the second in the world. And by Adrian Kantrowitz, who also invented the balloon pump. So that's the greatness of Maimonides. And, uh, you know, now the fate it's, uh, you know, meeting uh, is, as you said, a fate of geography. And uh, uh, there's not much one can do about it. And the it. same is true of Montefiore. True. Yes, indeed. Now, coming to some of the clinical issues that we face in the current environment, and all of us have been through this rather dark period, uh, not only from um, a macro perspective, but also I see every day, uh, you know, young people with significant uh, uh, psychological trauma emerging from these two or three years. Mm -hmm. So we've learned many clinical lessons from the pandemic, you know, first from uh, confronting basically a brand new disease to now knowing something about it. But from a systems perspective, what lessons have we learned and how do we prepare for the next pandemic? Whoa. Well, we've learned we need to be flexible. Um, it's, it's extremely important that people understand that when faced with unprecedented times, we have to take unprecedented actions. And um, uh, standing behind traditional roles isn't gonna help us. So that if we move people from unit to unit, if we change ratios of staffing from unit to unit, um, if we assign people who otherwise wouldn't be there, we have to have the flexibility to do that. Um, I, think, I think that's probably you know, lesson number one that, that we've learned here about that. Um, you know, we, we also have learned that um, this is very, very hard on staff. We understand that. So, you know, we've set up resilience centers um, so that people can go and talk about how stressful it is and get the help that they need and talk because that's very important. Uh, I recall and will never forget the following email I got from a nurse. A nurse wrote to me, um, uh, can't remember the unit, but she says, I was just off a 12 hour shift and three patients on my, that I was taking care of died. She said, prior to this epidemic, there might be one patient in a month that I would take care of who would die. Now I can't go home because I'm afraid that I'm going to carry COVID into my house, that I'm gonna get my children sick or my husband's sick. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to behave. Um, I can't put up with this anymore. Uh, I understand that. The stress is unbelievable. So, you know, we need to find ways that people like that can take a pause, can refresh, um, can talk to people about what they're seeing and how much it hurts, identify with it, and give them the advice and the time they need to be able to recover. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, one, I, one other thing before that, that I was gonna say about this. Of course. Um, I would suspect that all of us on this Zoom never entered medicine thinking that you might be putting your life on the line. You entered because you were happy to relieve suffering, to relieve pain, to maybe cure disease, to help humanity. If you wanted to put your life on the line, you could have joined the army, the Navy, the Marines or the police force, or maybe the fire, but you didn't. Yeah. Suddenly your life felt on the line. Yeah. Suddenly you were taking the risks that you never thought you would have to take in your life. Yeah. We have to be sensitive 
to what that meant for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely right, Doc. You know, uh, looking back, we were present at the beginning of another more indolent pandemic where we were beginning to see uh, the emergence of this virus that caused wasting and so on, and what we know today as AIDS. And those were very dark days as well. But now, of course, you know, things have changed and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, COVID is behind us. Now, you know, it's very important that this institution, we are very lucky because we have two psychiatrists heading these two areas, the med school and the hospital. And exactly this inaugural session of the Grand Rounds, I had Dr. Charney last year, Dean Charney, talking about resilience. And as you mentioned, you know, he's an expert in resilience, PTSD, and so on. And of course, the trauma was fresher about 12 months ago. And we went over some of this thing. And it's remarkable. And I hope other institutions did the same thing, but we did have a lot of resources and the administration and the leadership was very prepared or were very rapidly reactive to what they were seeing. Okay, now I'm just going to ask one final question and then open it up for questions. We have about uh, 10, 12 minutes. My final question is this one. You know, every day we are seeing the entrance of tech companies and private equity and so on, you know, CVS buying Signify, Amazon buying uh, Care One, all these things. And literally tens to hundreds of deals being made with dermatology practices and so on. What implications does this have for community medicine and academic medicine? Yes. Uh, dire, I think, on both counts. Um, you know, in, in my other hat as an investor and as a friend of a lot of people who do private equity, I know their business model. And their business model is to run these things in such a way that they can sell them at a profit. And I'm thinking, how do you take a primary care practice, which we know to begin with, isn't a great business, and then turn it around in such a way to sell it to the next person as a, at a profit. Who's going to buy that? I, I don't know. Um, I don't think that they are as sophisticated in the medical area as they might be, and that this may pause, cause big problems for them as well as the groups that they buy out. And you know, the groups that they're buying out get overwhelmed with the offers that they're being offered. They never thought that they'd have this kind of windfall. So of course they say yes. It's for the private equity guys then to think about what are they gonna to do to make this work? And how will their lives of those practitioners change once they're in the hands of private equity that's gotta run them and turn this into a big profit system so that they can sell it later. So I'm worried about it. Um, there is a reason why New York has stood behind the notion that our medical centers would not be not for profit. But of course, that doesn't extend to our big practices. Um, and the private equity people are coming in and trying to buy those big practices and change their direction. Uh, I'm concerned where, where that will go. So, I mean, time will tell. Um, but it's certainly um, an initiative that we have to have yeah. watched with great concern. Yeah, and not only, I guess, for the futures of these practitioners, but ultimately the patient will bear the burden, right? The patient and society. And but society, please... you're 100% right. You can imagine that none of these private equity people are picking up practices that do a lot of Medicaid. Um, and they're probably not all that happy with practices that are largely Medicare. So they want to buy practices in Scarsdale and Armonk and Chappaqua uh, or on, you know, and has it, you know, all the, the nice areas yeah. where you've got a whole bunch of commercial patients. Yeah. Um, but what does that leave for the rest of us? Uh, you know, another insolvable equation. So true. 
I have no further, I mean, I have tons of questions, but I think for now, I have really nothing more to add. Uh, Dr. Matthew has a question that he's posted on the chat. And he says, uh, thank you for your excellent walk through the history of the health system and your words of wisdom. Many physicians get job training for leadership roles. And it sounds like this was your journey. Do you have advice with regard to formal training for the clinician, be it an MBA, MHA, executive certifications, et cetera? Okay, I have none of that. Um, and uh, I don't know what I would have learned by doing it. Um, what helped me be effective was that I was a scientist who was data-driven and I used data to manage. Um, I also was helped by the fact that as a psychiatrist, I had some sense of how groups worked and how to make people feel effective uh, in, a, in a team. Um, uh, here's a little aside on that. Um, when I was watching Mount Sinai in those very dismal days when there was the turnaround committee, um, we had a lot of the executives before I took over meeting with the consultants <clears throat> and with trustees and um, the meetings of those groups were, to me, a, a psychiatrist who had actually studied a lot of group therapy with one of the really leaders in group therapy is something I really enjoyed while I was at Stanford. <clears throat> I was watching these enormously dysfunctional groups. Um, one member of this group, who's no longer with this team, I don't want to say his name, would wait to the very end of the meeting and then would say, you know, but here's why we can't do it. We'd have this play. Here's why we can't do it. Here's why this isn't a good idea. And he'd say, oh, this is illegal and that's illegal. And I don't think it. And then he'd walk out. And I thought, this is incredible. Everybody wants to prove they're smarter than everybody else in this meeting and nobody's solving problems. So when I came in, imagine alongside keeping Margaret, I let go. I terminated a whole bunch of this management team because I had a sense of how dysfunctional they were and how they'd never work as a team. And I brought in my team who had been working with me from psychiatry, who trusted me. Um, and the management team that we have in place here has largely been the team I've had for 20 years. <clears throat> we trust each other. And um, I didn't learn that anywhere. And that, wasn't, that didn't come from an MBA program or an MPH program. Um, maybe came a little bit from being a psychiatrist and running groups, <clears throat> or maybe it's just, you know, intuitive. So I come back to what I said at the beginning, which was if your goal in your, in what you're doing now is to ultimately have more of an administrative leadership role, just be very successful at what you do. Um, I think that reflects how you'll be successful in the next level job. Great. I think those are very important words for all of us to remember and distills down essentially to that idea. It's now 1.55. I have one last chance for people who want to ask a question. Otherwise, I want to thank you so much for a very engaging hour, very useful, uh, very informative, and we will it'll stay with us for a very long time. Anyone? Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you, everybody. Over and out. Thank you. Bye-bye.